Welcome to today's Fireside Chat, How to Safeguard Against Data Loss, brought to you by Insight and Commvault. I'm Teresa Cortez, Senior Product Manager here at Insight for Cybersecurity Solutions, and I'll be your host. Provided that data is quite possibly one of the most valuable assets, today we're going to talk about threats facing organizations, some best practices to reduce your risk, as well as solutions to help recover from a disaster. Joining me in this discussion is Insight's lead architect focused on data protection, Mike Morgan, and Commvault's Senior Director of Sales Engineering, David Langley. Welcome, Mike and David. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Thanks, Teresa. Yeah, bet. Thanks for having us. So there are many threats facing organizations, and the cost of a data breach continues to increase. So Mike, starting with you, can you talk about some current threats facing businesses and how attackers are getting in? You bet. So I would say that the, the biggest things we've learned since COVID is the rise in the amount of ransomware attacks uh, that have been out there. Uh, we are learning and seeing uh, through even our clients how the attacks are getting more and more sophisticated. They're organized. Uh, sometimes we even see a, a concept known as ransomware as a service where there are multiple attackers and, you know, some are just gaining the entry point because that's their specialization. Then they'll hand it off to another team that, you know, are good at you know seeing how far they can spread and then there'll be those that do the extortion uh, of it so it, it is literally a team attack and then they all kind of spread it out and we've even seen it where they'll even actually do support uh, for the companies to help to get them through it so it is very highly organized sometimes state sponsored um but it is that is probably one of the biggest things in my mind with that uh, but i can't also um forget that the internal uh, kind of threats that sometimes we see. Um, these are a little bit more benign. It's not a full ransomware attack, but it's in the realm of where we see phishing and social engineering. Um, we see that as we go out to, you know, uh, some of the other uh, professional social networks, I mean, we'll say even like LinkedIn, it's pretty easy to go figure out who goes work for a company and maybe what their main positions are. And so people are using that information and doing something known as spear phishing, where they are doing a lot of research, they're finding out what the financials are, maybe they uh, know that there's a m and that a company just did, and they will target those type of companies. In the case of ransomware, sometimes they'll say, we they'll ask for about maybe 10 percent of what that m a purchase is knowing that they have the money to go buy that company so they probably have enough money to spend 10 percent of that on you know the the cost of a ransomware attack um but i would say in terms of uh, phishing and the things that we see internally that could be as simple as an email that somebody gets and we'll just use the you know term of uh for like linkedin as an example sometimes you may see that everything they'll have the the right icons and graphics and they'll say hey your password expired uh please log in to re-verify yourself and what they'll do is they'll log in but they won't notice that maybe the i in linkedin you know the last i for the in is maybe a cyrillic character that is not a normal i but it looks like an eye and it's they're taken to a website that looks just like the entry page to LinkedIn. But what's happening in the background is that they're actually sitting on another machine that is now captioning their username and password. And you see that six digit uh, authentication code noticed uh, TOTP or time based uh, one time passwords. And for that moment, now the attackers have now collected their username and password and because of that uh, multi-factor authentication they're able to collect the cookie that is stored and this is something known as session hijacking and then we can take that cookie put it on their own system and now log in as them because that's that's how cookies work they save us save us from a login so there's very advanced ways that that's being done we've seen it uh, from 
um, I'll say maybe a combination ransomware and social engineering attack where the attackers are, are already on the inside and they're sitting on the war room calls. Maybe they're off camera because they're not the right person. Um, and maybe the name is misspelled just slightly or has an extra extra space. You know, so in my case, Mike Space Space Morgan. And nobody notices, you know, maybe there's a double mic uh, that's on the call. So there's very... Um, a plethora of those things that are happening, uh, you know, other insider threats, you know, that uh, I can think of in terms of how we're connected now via VPN. Um, and that goes both ways. So whatever we're bringing into the company that is on our laptops that might be at our home networks or vice versa, if there is an attack at the company, and our, we're connected via VPN, now our home network might be vulnerable to some of those things. My, I've also seen, I'm oh, sorry to interrupt, Teresa, but you were met, you're talking about those spear phishing emails and the websites that they get redirected to. I'm shocked yeah. at how proficient chat GPT is in crafting emails with impeccable grammar uh, and crafting lookalike websites. Uh, it's amazing how hard it is now to tell the fake websites from the original ones, or even a couple of years ago, if you were paying attention, it was pretty easy to spot. I don't think that's the case anymore. Agreed. Now, I would say that you're, you're absolutely right. And no longer do we have to worry about, we'll say, the you know Nigerian kind of uh, scams you know, for money, where we can see mis you know just misspellings and and how a uh, new crown prince wants to offer me money, and yeah, only if I can help you know give him a bank account to help funnel this through his country. No, we're not seeing those anymore. I think we've all seen them, but you're absolutely right. We're seeing very well crafted ones, even in the sense of. Um, uh, using sometimes rewards and many companies have little kudos or they can log in as like, oh, you have so many reward points. Go use those. I've seen it to where um, I've even <laughs> gotten an email that looked like it was from my boss that says, hey, congratulations. You have a couple of extra 100 points of these rewards. Good job, blah, blah, blah. And if you click on it or highlight over that, you'll see that it is going somewhere else and not to that normal reward site. So even something like that, you know, we people are hands down, don't want to lose something. You know, we have this uh, sunk cost. We don't want to miss out on a cool benefit or reward. And we're so quick to click on some of those things. Uh, and there's there's so many stories of even, uh, you know, we'll say smart architects that might click on a link to maybe somebody who's in accounts receivable who does that, maybe, you know, you know modifies and clicks on their web, you know, their FedEx account. Um, and on that FedEx account is also the company's bank account. And now they're able to funnel money out of that. I've seen that exact scenario. And these poor people just don't realize what's happening to them. In addition to that, you know, once the threat actors are in the system, they really take that opportunity to look around and get access to the points that they want to get access to, right? Which really yeah. brings us to that data protection layer. But it's becoming harder just with the change in our threat landscape. Um, organizations have a lot more to manage. So can you expand a little bit more as to what businesses what makes it so challenging, I should say, for businesses to help protect that data today versus maybe five years ago? Right. Well, I, I, I would say we see a continuation of a lot of things around cloud security. Uh, the, the idea and concept around cloud is great. There's a shared responsibility um, of that. But essentially, it's the cloud security almost is as good as you want to build it. Uh, think about how... Uh, many companies have a physical data center. And in that data center, or even a, we'll say if it's even a colo uh, of that, the building's already there. Walking in the front door has its own security and guards and so forth, and maybe the racks are locked in the cloud. And we'll say you to use a, maybe an infrastructure as a service or IS, you have to build it all. You know, they have the underlying actual physical you know, cabling of it. But on top of that, 
you need to set up your firewalls, your routes, and so forth. That's that's all on you. That's the other part of that shared responsibility. They can take care of the base layer, um, but if you have left a S3 bucket with uh, poor credentials, or you're, maybe you're posting that uh, those credentials because maybe your company uses GitHub or GitLab or something like that as its code repository, and if those credentials are in that, then there are people scanning GitHub and GitLab looking for things like that. Um, there's There could also be misconfigurations of it. So there's so many different ways from, a will say, even a cloud security uh, aspect that you have to be aware of. And that's where maybe in many cases, the although the hybrid cloud is, is more, we're seeing a lot more clients do the hybrid clouds because there are things that they know that they can protect within the four walls, but they want to be able to get some of the cloud economics. And but now they have two different environments to match. And so that's what you know, I would say that's some of the challenges around there, whether it's configuration uh, or even in the case of misconfiguration, uh, that maybe the visibility that they don't have. And maybe it's even, um, you know, bump it up to even the uh, software as a service. That is one aspect of cloud, whether you're using um, the uh, the Apple um, Apple uh, uh, App Center or even Salesforce, you're relying on the, the vendor in those cases to have everything else underneath. And you just want to have that experience. But what's happening to your login? What, what else is happening underneath the hood to your data that you're storing on those? So there's so many different layers of it, um, and it and it's hard to match. And I would think that's probably one of the biggest challenges uh, that are out there. And there's probably a couple of others that come to mind, but that's I would say there's one to start with. Um, I would say too, you know, vulnerabilities are becoming more challenging to keep up with for organizations, just in the sense that the threat landscape has grown so significantly because more and more companies are investing in endpoints and devices, um, not just through remote work, but to capture data um, at the edge, right? And then to bring that data back in so that they can use that to progress their business, right? And stay ahead and, and remain competitive. And so right. when you have all those endpoints, they're just more places where a threat actor can look to find a vulnerability. Um, so yeah. there's definitely a lot of, you know, a lot of challenges facing organizations today. Yeah, and, and think about it with, with our phones uh, that we have here. How many people just blindly click on Oh, allow access to all the storage. Allow access to all your contacts that are on there. That you know, some of the, those apps mean that they can go check out what do other apps have uh, in that. So that that endpoint, you know, we'll say the, even this is an endpoint. That's part of that data. And uh, we always have to realize that you know, sometimes we may not directly think uh, of a monetary value of things. But if, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, that that the data is that value. And so if we're if we're not cognizant um, of that, then we ourselves and our own data that we have can become the product uh, that people are interested in buying. Definitely. In addition to that, you know, organizations are facing an internal challenge, which we'll call the balancing act. Um, they are trying to secure all these new technologies, um, their threat landscape, and their very valuable data, but they're limited both from a resource perspective and from an investment perspective. Do you mind expanding on that a little bit and what you're finding with your customers? Well, it's, it's truly a balance of looking at how much they want to have uh, with a third party vendor uh, or do internally. You know, we've seen just in the past recent years of uh, different third party or supply chain type of risks uh, that are out there and how some of those vulnerabilities and it could be it could be a thing of, of exposure of data that allows that in there. Or we can see it in others uh, of, of recent one that happened uh, with a, a security software where they had a flaw in their data 
and it wasn't fully regression tested and that pushed out. And then that little agent that was on many, many machines and laptops and servers took down everything from airports uh, to other businesses you know, where they're frozen. So sometimes it's not even, it's, it's sad that um, things do happen. You know, those surprises uh, do happen. And sometimes they're not malicious. Sometimes they are benign. Uh, but there is an awareness of where do we want to have these things and what is the risk of those. I'm, the hope, though, is that as these are happening, because sometimes I think a lot of people put their head in their sand and they just have this implicit trust that is out there. But the sometimes the events of these things are that wake up call to sit, figure out, was that the right choice? Can we do it better? How can I what we can how can we hold our our vendors and and third party, you know, whether it's third party vendors or other suppliers? Um, I'm not say responsible, but where do we? It's it's our our company's data. Where do we draw that line, and where do we ensure that if we're going to invest in this other company, that there's a quid pro quo uh, of security awareness and uh, of I'll call it a culture of care of our data. Well, it's interesting. You we talk about culture is we talk about organizations making decisions, and the reality is it's individuals within different departments. And the fact that yeah. you know you might have a Salesforce administrator and a messaging expert and a telephony expert and a data center and a cloud center of excellence all within the same company. And sometimes they communicate very regularly and they have security board reviews and best practices like that, but often they don't. And so these different silos are relying on their own skills, their own experience to make these decisions that you're talking about. And some haven't ever had, had to gone through a breach. And so they might not be as forward thinking in terms of the decisions they're making and whether they're secure or not in their planning. So it's 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 easy to talk in broad brushes like, like we do, but the reality is it does come down to individuals in these different departments that that are managing these threat vectors that threat actors take advantage of. You bet. And, and many people are wearing multiple hats. Um, sometimes budgets are tight. And we most often we have to remember that, you know, in, in most businesses, IT is a service, you know, to the company and not the revenue generator. Um, and so we they they have those resource challenges as well, on top of trying to meet a a layer of security expectations, you know, whether that is uh, done through internal governance or external compliance. We talked a lot about the challenges organizations are facing, um, which we can see is quite extensive. So what do you recommend um, to your customers to do when they're looking at establishing an effective data protection strategy? Well, I think there there's definitely a, a, a you know, I would call it like a balancing act uh, on, on some of the things that uh, needs to do. Um, with security controls, uh, sometimes there is a balance of of user convenience because uh, if they if they don't know how to do something, then they're not going to do it. And they if we expect um, password changes uh, on a frequent basis, and it has to be very complex and convoluted. People are going to just put a sticky note because they're not going to remember that. Uh, there's other different ways that uh, that can be mitigated, you know, of saying, you know, maybe it's not about complexity of a password, for example. Maybe it's about length of a password. Um, and there's uh, some really, uh, there's actually some funny little cartoons that talk about password entropy uh, that are out there. And it shows that you could take literally uh, three words and separate them by maybe a symbol or a character or a dash, put a number in there, and now you have a you know 21 to 26 character password. That's going to take a long time to uh, compromise. So there's simplicity that can be done there. Uh, but also, uh, and we think that uh, using multi-factor authentication, what is the uh, simplicity of that? Is it a... Um, is it a a little key card like the old RSA cards where we had uh, we have to you know have that you know in hand hope the batteries are still active and look at that is it a simple thing we can just you know use our fingerprint or uh, punch in a number on that is it a, a security key that we literally can just stick in the side of the laptop and push the button showing a physical presence here 
at this device, um, which then sends an attestation to say, yes, they've they've authenticated this person is here and not halfway around the world. And so there's definitely a balancing act with the use of that con convenience and tools. Uh, there, there's several other things. So I be happy to be happy to go you know further down but that that's one way that uh, kind of sticks out to me you also previously discussed a recovery versus a backup mindset uh do yes. you mind explaining that a little bit further yeah that's that's a great way to think about that so i would say that uh many companies don't invest you know, that time, those money, the resources into the backup systems because people say, you know, we just rarely recover. You know, we hardly do any restores. Uh, but we're finding that ransomware has changed that. And now you're going to have some mass recoveries uh, of systems that were unexpected. Uh, we're They're learning that DR, traditional DR plans, disaster recovery plans, don't quite fit into a ransomware scenario um of it because of how things can be partially affected you know there are dr scenarios that most most often you're looking at a full site that needs to move over to another site but what if it's just a partial system what if it's just affecting authentication or dns or so forth and so they're all realizing that um that it, it's it's different out there and you have to have a recovery mindset of it to think that it's not about how long backs are taking, but the other side is to think, how long are we going to be able to be in a, a last known good state uh, of things, whether that be a backup, whether that be a snapshot of, of something, uh, but that that's going to affect the entire, the entire organization or different teams. Uh, David, you mentioned a good thing about the siloing of that. How many times have we seen it to where um, the app team is affected differently from the infrastructure team and then the security teams looking on the side saying, well, you're both wrong. Uh, I mean, you're both you're both uh, kind of at, at fault at things. So there are so many different teams and then teams within those teams. We think, you know, think about global deployments where it's like, OK, here's the North America team and then there's the Asia, Asia Pac or EMEA type team. Um, so that almost leads into a thing of another good point of, you know, in, in addition to mindset is trust, you know, is if you asked a, a, a CISO or even down to the backup admin or anywhere in between, you know, whether IT director or so forth, what is that confidence layer that they will be able to recover in a timely manner? And there's a lot of words that I just put in there, you know, of confidence, of a timely manner, because that's going to be different to everybody. Um, but that's part of the trust that they need to have, not only in their systems, but in their process uh, of it too. I appreciate being recovery focused, and, and especially because when people think about backup and recovery, they usually think about restoring a file or restoring a workload. Uh, it, we at Convo, we would call that an operational recovery. And then there's disaster recovery, where now we've got to do a bunch of machines uh, and manage the interdependencies. But in both of those cases, if I've got a strong backup, I can generally trust where I'm recovering to. This whole cyber recovery, cyber resiliency is a very different conversation. Now, back to your comment of trust, Mike, I can't trust where the data came from. Frankly, I can't even trust the backups until I do testing, Look, hopefully looking at some kind of machine learning to find which backup is probably the most trustworthy. Uh, but there's a lot more that goes into a cyber recovery that we traditionally didn't have to plan for in disasters. And it really does revolve around that trust. Can I, can I trust the data I'm restoring to? And can I trust res the place I'm restoring to? Uh, I should say the data I am restoring and where I'm restoring to, because both of those could have been compromised at different phases of the attack. And so it really takes a lot more planning. And the more recovery focused you are, the backups generally go better because you've got a better image, or you have a better concept of what you're trying to capture to make that outcome that you're practicing happen. So if you've got that recovery mindset, the backups always end up going better because you know what you need out of them when you go to do that recovery. So it's a great way to approach the problem. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I, what I like to say is that, you know, technology won't save the day by itself. It should be, but it should be leveraged 
as part of a larger or orchestration between different business requirements and an executable process, um, which actually I have, a, I have a, a thing that I've put together over the years. A lot of people ask me, it's like, Mike, uh, we got so many VMs and gigasquirts and megacycles all over the place. What, what do we need? You know, just tell us where to start. And a lot of times I, I back them up and I say, well, I have an approach, you know, kind of a thoughts. And I literally put together um, kind of a, a, a triangular Venn diagram of three intersecting circles. And those, what those three are is I, uh, I have one that says why, and that's your business requirements. That's your internal governance, your external compliance that you might have. That is your RPRTOs, um, you know, it's recovery point objective, recovery time objective, just to, you know, spell those out. You know, any of your service level agreements or SLAs uh, that are in there, this, that's the kind of compliance of why we're doing something. And another section, uh, uh, circle, as I call it, how, and that could be you know, part of your people in process, but in terms of a of a data management mindset or data protection, uh, I see that is that is your incident response plan, your crisis communication you know, procedures that are on there. And la that last circle is the what. Uh, and yes, that is your technology, that is your VMs, your databases and so forth. And what I think of this is kind of this uh, triangular overlap is that there is a circular overlap in the middle where all three of those things, the why, how, and what, will intersect. And that's where I put a simple thing saying solution. And what I tell my clients is that a solution, a true solution um, only exists when you're considering all three of those at the same time. If you start with one and don't consider the others, you'll pay for it you know, later down the line of it. So it's really a thought approach, just like the, the mindset that we had between backup and recovery. I think this is a mindset of where do we start? Um, you know, Simon Sinek had a, a famous TED talk and he says, start with why? And if you start with that, then you can understand what is the purpose behind what we're doing with our technology and how should we, you know, scope our process around these things. It's so important that you talk about that. Um, just in general, in you know, security services, we talk about you know people, processes, and technology, and how you can't have one without the other. If you don't have the people to support the technology, or who know how to use it, or are trained on it, it really doesn't you know matter, right? So it's it's definitely a great point to bring up. Um, you you also previously in, in former conversations we had talked a little bit about a different mindset as well. Uh, and, you know, when we look at best practices or maybe even things that um, are almost taken for granted and so we just don't do them. Um, one thing that we all agree on is testing, right? Just ensuring that you, just because you have a backup plan and, you know, you think it's solid, if you don't test it, you really don't know and, and it kind of comes to being prepared, right? Being as prepared as possible. Um, yep. But kind of further on your testing, you talked about a little bit of an agile mindset. Do you mind talking uh, about that a little bit? You bet. Um, and, and maybe to kind of also just to lead into this, I mean, we talked about a little bit earlier, is that we're talking about how surprises will happen, you know, where they're whether they're just accidental deletions or or whatever it might be uh, to the malicious kind. Um, so I think there's we should always assume uh, just there's a there's a ter another term of assume breach. You know, for those who are very security mindset, you know, they they understand this that assume there you've already been breached. So how do I shore things up in uh, in the within the four walls of that so if we always know that there will be surprises um even with the best plans the the thing that i think of um is a, a quote from louis pasteur you know the microbiologist who uh, is credited with germ theory he once said that chance favors the prepared mind and so that leads into how do we help be more prepared just like uh like the eagle scout in me you know would say be prepared and you you hit on it which is test and test more and test a little bit more often than that and so in that agile mindset as you're kind of mentioning you know i think we can learn a lot uh from what a lot of the software driven approaches are uh that are out there is that you think that you have three things that 
happen. You know, starting with Agile, Agile is really focusing on that development process. You're removing some of these barriers and enabling the stakeholders to collaborate. Um, we talked about how who's affected by an outage. That might be a business owner uh, that is uh, that is there. You could have different components of that application. Uh, that application could be, you know, is often most of applications are multiple tiers. The data has got to be stored somewhere. So that's going to be stored with the infrastructure team on some kind of storage, whether it's on-prem uh, or in the cloud. Uh, you're going to have a, a database you know, that it sits on and then everything else. You're going to have different uh, code versions that are there. And so with an agile, uh, you know, mindset or that approach to that so the development process is you're going to make the collaboration better so that there's less finger point on that. Another good thing to think about is uh, there's a term of GRC or governance, risk and compliance that happens um, in such a way that one in one example, I can think of a, a company that they literally, as we were talking with them and asking them, hey, what are some of your process controls? They actually showed how they can list out. Here is our backup policy and our retentions and those SLAs, those RPOs, RTOs that we talked about earlier, and they've been signed off by the C-level or CISO or so forth. And so that way we are engaging both the boots on the ground, but the business side as well. And that, that where you have cross input of things. Um, I would say that also leads into where Agile focuses on process. Um, the other term that you see very often with software development is CICD or continuous improvement, continuous development. That is more on the practice of things. And that's where you'll see things like tooling and automation to maybe know what is your recovery uh, point and objectives and recovery time objective at any at any moment. Uh, that way we're not scratching our head to say, hey, if something were to happen right now, how long is it going to take? And usually some people say, well, it depends. That's the famous uh, engineering term. But what if we had better uh, uh, tooling that could literally say, if we had a documented process of these individual steps and, they're, and they know how long that, that each step takes, we can later say, well, this application may take three minutes to do. This will take another 15 to get here and so forth and so forth. And to jump back into the, uh, the C word of culture, um, is DevOps is that culture. You know, sometimes we see uh, DevOps is to be almost a little figure eight on its side where you have development on side and the operations. So, but it's the idea that they're all working hand on hand. Why? Because they're cross trained on different tasks and the expectations of what each team is known to everybody. And that enables us to raise the bar on some of the weakest links that are out there, which is the people. Because if we have defined process and we use an automation, we're taking some of these things that we would normally make mistakes out and we're finding the flaws in the system. Hence, going back to the testing is we've learned, oh, what if Mike's not around? Um, okay. So have we documented Mike's process? Is there anybody who can replace them? What if Mike gets hit by a bus or, or so forth? So we we take iterative approaches, do it often, whether on the quarterly. I would say probably quarterly or semi-annually might be best. Maybe you just take a portion of the, of the business and do it. It doesn't have to be a full yearly failover because what happens if you're, you are almost about to do a test and then there you find out um, you get impacted by something. Well, maybe it's almost been a whole year since you even looked back at that documentation. So do an iterative approach uh, of these things. Take the software-driven uh, approach uh, between Agile, CICD, and the DevOps side and put that into your organizations. That's such great advice. It's always a reiterative process, especially as technology changes, as threats change. Um, it's always great to kind of relook and ensure that you are keeping up to date with all of that, right? Um, and then if something changes within your organization, just ensuring that you've modified your policies and procedures to match that. So really great point. Um, in addition, there's definitely some risk mitigation strategies that customers can look at, right, when they're protecting their data, like data classification and zero trust. Um, do you mind talking a little bit more about what are some best practices around data protection strategies to minimize the risks? 
You bet. Uh, I think we've touched on a lot of really having a data focused uh, or becoming data focused, whether that's a mindset or however people want to call it. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's making your data work for you instead of against you. One one way that I can see that uh, sometimes happening is that, uh, David, we mentioned earlier how uh, different parts of the organization can, be, can become siloed in, in that. And within those individual teams, uh, even each vendor that those teams may have, they may have their own monitoring dashboard that they use to review the status of of a of a LUN or storage device or something, uh, or you know, the, we'll say even the backup success rate or whatever it might be. But what happens is that that is only looked at by that one team. And there's another way of taking something called more of an observability approach, where we can utilize maybe a data pipeline to bring in different sources of data. Sometimes uh, there's a term called melt data, which stands for metrics, events, logs, and traces. Everybody has those, whether you're uh, from the infrastructure side, uh, security tooling, or even the application has those. But if we can pull those that data in, we are actually bringing those teams together and we can paint a, a bigger picture of the impact of those things across the different organization. You know, we think from a log4j, you know, the, the exploit that happened, you know, a couple of years ago. What was the impact? That's more of an application, but how did it affect other things? And we can understand that term of the blast radius uh, that is there. And what the goal is you know, from that, uh, you know, have an observable state of, of different parts of the organization is that you can have that kind of urgent data that you need available in maybe an event driven dashboard for that immediate analysis. Now, the other cool thing is if you're using like a data pipeline is there's a lot of data that maybe you don't care about or it's more subcritical, but it might be valuable in terms of doing forensic analysis. Maybe all that data gets forked off that we have the data dashboard uh, piece that we look at, but all the other data that maybe we not need to look at right now, but might be valuable at a later time, maybe that is stored in a data lake at another time so we can recall or replay those logs into a security tool as if it was happening in real time to catch things, to improve on things and so forth. So I think from a mo there is a monitoring observability aspect of you know understanding the difference of those because those bring in the teams. Um, you did what you hit another thing too with zero trust uh, on that. So often we hear zero trust uh, from a networking perspective that we don't trust a particular device that logs into the network. But I think it also goes beyond that of thinking, you know, from a user perspective, how are we uh, implementing maybe something that another concept known as least privilege uh, that people only have the rights that we only need. You know, think about their um, one of the things of you have authentication into a system and, and that's just to get you in the front door, but then what are you authorized to see? And, you know, I think where zero trust comes in and also at least privilege as well, is that we are whittling things down that maybe that the, the whole organization should not have access to the HR um, home directories. Uh, obviously, there might be a lot of sensitive data. There's social security numbers and other personal data that might be in there. Um, but that is that, you know, really kind of feeds into maybe even a data minimization uh, type aspect. Uh, and this whole the whole goal of this is reducing risk, um, you know, to there. And no matter what, you know, we also should have uh, with that data, since we're becoming data focused, to have all the encryption that we can do in, in place and at multiple levels. Uh, we've talked about different access controls like multi-factor authentication, different password policy and so forth. That all goes into it. Um, there, sometimes encryption can be a little bit of a double-edged sword as depending on how we use it. Um, but I think as we understand that the concepts of encryption at rest, of course, encryption at flight between different data centers or um, across public networks using the VPNs that we have on our laptops, especially when you're down at the coffee shop, those types of things, this it all plays in together to have this, this mindset. I love that word, but I think that really says it. Before we jump into the technology aspect of it, you also mentioned a survey um, customers can take to kind of understand where they're at today. 
Yeah, uh, so what we, something that we've developed internally at Insight, we, we call it the Ransomware Recoverability Survey. And many, uh, many of my peers and I uh, thought about what are the top 20 or so questions that we always ask, always ask clients um, of, you know, and it's very similar to what we talked about today. What is your, you know, what is your established RPR to, you know, what is your collaboration different teams look like? Uh, what is your protection policies and so forth? So we put all of our questions that we commonly do, um, and this is something we did earlier this year. We put these questions together. We found some some of the overlap and, and took those out. And where our uh, ransomware recoverability survey, or RRS as we call it uh, internally, is that right now it's at 23 questions, almost like the 23andMe genetic test that is, is out there. Very simple, streamlined, takes only about five to seven minutes for anybody, you know, whether you're at a C level or a backup admin to go through. Um, they, they're, we're not taking a vendor approach at this. This is very kind of high level questions, but what we've based it on is and tra tracked every single question is to the NIST cybersecurity framework, the brand new 2.0 version that includes governance. And so for those who are familiar with the uh, cybersecurity framework, the 1.0 version that included uh, different aspects of it, identifying detecting, protecting, responding, and recovering uh, on that wheel. But they've seen how governance um, and including the business side is such a critical piece, really more of a strategic piece to it, that we've incorporated that as well into our survey. And so we have a dashboard that literally gives a meter uh, based on some of the weighed answers, whether somebody said yes, no, or maybe I'm not sure if if this component exists uh, in their organization. We, we have a uh, this little speedometer shows about where they are overall, but then we also show where they at from that strategic versus uh, tactical approach of of their protection strategies, uh, that mindset uh, that is there. So that is an offering that we have. It's literally at no cost. So a lot of people are you know tightening the belt nowadays, uh, but we want to find a, a good entry point that clients could use to kind of give a high level, really in the door uh, talking point that where we go from here to say, maybe we'll look at a, um, a BCDR plan or include a business impact analysis that is a next step. Maybe it is a state of data protection that they want to learn what else is out there. Uh, what are the differences on those? So it's the, uh, the RRS or that ransomware recoverability survey is a great door opener. Like I said, it takes five to seven minutes uh, to complete. And uh, we probably might have a link uh, to how to get to that uh, afterwards. That's great. Um, speaking of strategy, when David, you talk to customers about Commvault solutions, I know you also brought up the why, which is so critical in, you know, or the C-suite to determine where to invest their resources and time, right? What are they protecting? Can you expand a little bit more on, on Commvault's approach and what you talk to customers about? Sure. No, thanks, Teresa. It's a good question because this is a really big topic. Uh, you know, Mike's touched on just a few of the different aspects that we can't all be experts in, but we have to be aware and we have to incorporate them into our decision making. So at Combo, we break it up into three, I won't call them silos, but three different thought processes. First, risk, then readiness, and then recover. So from a risk perspective, it all starts with understanding where your sensitive information is and what your most critical applications are. It's far too expensive and far too complicated to treat all of our data and all of our applications the exact same way. So if we can identify just that data and the dependencies in between them, we can start crafting, at least surgically at the beginning, what it takes to get to a minimal, minimum viable company, we'll call it that, to get your business back up and running so as quickly as possible, because we can't treat, again, all the data the same. And at Combat, we have a number of tools that identify uh, your sensitive data based on the information that you provide. We can run scans against your environment to identify information that meets those criteria. And we also have tools like Cloud Rewind that actually map your cloud estate if, for those applications that are up in the cloud to identify not only the data, but the applications and all those interdependencies that Mike talked about from route paths to firewalls and all those uh, small but super critical configuration details that separate uh, a recovery uh, effort to actually a running application. So that's on the risk side. Let's, I, let's understand the problem so we can right size our approach to get the best possible outcome. 
in the middle is readiness. And this is really, this is the day-to-day -day grunt work of being a cyber resilient organization. First of all, we have to detect those anomalous events or, or activities happening in our environment as early as possible. So Commvault's invested in cyber deception technology, real-time anomaly detection within machines and within file systems, as well as with our own systems. And all of this data in real time gets piped into the customer's ecosystem. So we recognize security operations has so many dashboards. Mike touched on it. There's just too many tools. Well, rather than trying to be, you know, interface number 48 for the security team, we're going to take a lot of the insights we see and we're going to pump all that into their SEM and SOAR systems so that those, uh, you know, AI big brain technologies can use the insights that Commvault gathers to help make a better informed decision. And yes, now that we're looking for these anomalies day to day, we go into actually protecting your data. And again, not just in the data center, but up in the cloud and in those SaaS apps and at the edge that you talked about, Teresa, we have to protect all of it with a standard so that we have one process to protect and one process to restore. The moment we start having different tools in different locations, it's just another element of risk and a skill set, frankly, we may not have when the time comes to do something really hard. Uh, and then again, just like Mike was talking about, we have to secure not just the data itself, but how about those backups and the environments that we're going to be restoring to. And that's with immutability and error gaps, role-based access controls, like Mike was talking about, multi-factor authentication, encryption, separated authentication domains, key management systems, password rotation tools. The list goes on and on. And frankly, most organizations already have it, but we have to think about this in the context of being cyber resilient, not just the wall keeping the bad guys out, but how can we leverage these tools to make sure that our escape path is protected just if just as stringently, if not more stringently than the than the actual production data. It's hard to think about it that way, but that's kind of what it takes. And then finally, from a readiness perspective, let's test at scale. Um, restoring one file, restoring one workload, it really doesn't fit what's going to happen in the event of a cyber attack. So let's test it at least application scale. What to get an application back, what are those routes? What do we need to have the Active Directory installed before we even bring the application and the data back and include a forensic motion? Once we restore that data, let's have our cyber team take a look at what we restored and test it to make sure that they believe it's clean. Because maybe the attack that they used to get in was a zero day, which means there was no virus definition. There was no way to track it when it happened. But now that we've identified the attack and we're going through remediation, it is defined and forensics, uh, the SecOps team will be able to run a forensics test to clean that bad action out. So that's risk and that's readiness. And then finally, recovery. Uh, and, and Mike touched on it. Do we have a plan to get the data back in a time frame? that suits the business. Because again, Insight can provide amazing recovery capabilities, uh, but you know, the faster we go, the more expensive it, it becomes. So we have to look at balancing the risk business is willing to take on with that performance. But let's have that conversation now. Part of the RRS, all right, are they our recovery rate, ransomer readiness survey? Yes, RRS, thank you. Uh, the RRS is identifying, can we get back in? What is a reasonable timeline, right? So let's have those conversations now before we need to go through it. And again, those forensics, it's great to do it when we're testing. Let's definitely do forensics before we promote something back into production because we don't want to bring the, the malware or whatever trick, nasty trick they used to get back in right back into, into production when it happens. Uh, and then arguably, and we talked about this early on, the most important thing is let's figure out who needs to be involved in the recovery before we do the recovery. It's not just about IT. It's not just about SecOps. What about legal teams, application teams, dev teams, even users? Let's build a resilience team so that when we go through this recovery effort, we've got not only the right tools, but the right people and the right skill sets to get it done. That is a very long answer, but it's a really complicated program uh, process but that's how we break it out for our customers. And then we can choose, you know, with, with great insight from insight, as well as our customer and the Commvault team to figure out where the best places are to start. We're not gonna tackle all these on the first day, but if we if we can chunk it up in a way and pick up the low hanging fruit to start, we can have a meaningfully in, meaningful impact on the quality of that restore. Definitely, no, that's a great point. Um, and talking about their data restore, right? Threat actors are actually now also trying to go after backups. 
Um, Kumpel really looks at this, right, and considers different paths to help safeguard that data backup. Do you mind talking a little bit more about that and explaining what your team does? Sure. Uh, and yes, there's there's a lot to it. Uh, immutability is not a feature, right? <laughs> it's it's an operations, it's a process, and it's ever evolving. Uh, but immutability, it's a great place to start. Um, it's actually, there's a number of surveys out there where immutability now is a term familiar to a lot of board members because they understand how critical it is to not have your backups manipulated during a breach. Well, immutability is not a new term. It's been around for a very long time, just maybe had went by different names. Really what we're doing is if we have uh, privileges compromised, can those same privileges affect the backup copies? And we can achieve, we can achieve that separation where that's not the case. Again, back with role-based authentication controls and multi-factor authentication. But a key part of immutability and air gap is that separated authentication. Whatever authentication mechanisms we're using in production, we'd like to use a separate one or maybe an entirely separate environment to do the authentication inside of backups. There's a lot of great tools and uh, documented processes to make this happen. This isn't something you have to figure out uh, by yourself. Insight Engineering is very good at this. Please leverage them. Uh, but then also layering in things like key management systems, not just combo key management systems. We might use a key management system on-prem, and maybe if you're up in Azure, they have their own key management system that we can employ. The more layers we put on top of our data protection data, the much, much harder it is for those bad actors to break through all these different layers. And as we continue to evolve, as technologies continue to evolve, as you're doing your briefings with your insight consultants, think about how can we further enhance what we're doing today. There's no one stroke. There's no one appliance that says you're instantly immutable. We have to look at this holistically, uh, but Combo provides a lot of different mechanisms, a lot of different layers to make things as hard as possible on those threat actors who are trying to break into not just your production, but your backups too. Maybe if I could on, on that, uh, another term that that we are also introducing to many clients is, you know, in, in addition to the mutability, is also things of indelible or indelibility. Uh, because what happens a lot is, although things may be locked down, um, that things can be changed. If they can just simply flush it and delete it, then it's as good as not being there. And there, there are several things into, uh, uh, whether it's backup and storage systems of uh, protections against that, um, even thinking about um, as backups expire, there is a time clock on those. And then how is that time clock monitored so that it all of a sudden isn't rolling backwards or forwards um, unexpectedly to you know, to flush those backups. So maybe if we have something of uh, a backup that is flagged for three months retention and they move the clock ahead, is the backup system going to flush that? Now, there's all those are all different kinds of protections. So I'm so glad you mentioned uh, all, you know, all these things. And I wanted to include that, um, that the, that indelibleness uh, that it's just as important. And I think it kind of gets put into some of the terms around immutability, uh, but that is the thing that is catching a lot of people. And I, I would say some of the thing that comes to mind is around snapshots is they can't change those snapshots, but can they delete them with that same access? And so there's two different ways of approaching uh, that, but again, it goes into the mindset of how, how are we shoring up protection? 100% Mike, well said. Um, when we look at Commvault solutions, or really just, you know, any backup solution in general, but um, the goal is to, you know, it's a, it's a very difficult process to do well, right? But the goal is to use technologies to help streamline that process. So do you mind maybe pointing out, you know, just a couple key features that Commvault provides that helps with operations, you know, whether it's just normal daily operations, like you mentioned, the universal view, or even during an incident, what your customers have communicated that have been, you know, extra helpful for them. Excellent. Yeah, no, good question, Teresa, because th this doesn't, it, we have to live with this. It's a day to day thing. And so at Convault, we spend a lot of time developing technologies to make the care and feeding of the solution and the outcome 
easier, uh, but again, shouldn't be in a silo, right? How can we help SecOps? How can we help administrators who have other day jobs? Like you say, we wear many hats, uh, get their job done. And you mentioned one great one, right? Universal view. The more data we can roll into a single solution, into a single operational process, the easier it is for everybody. I, ha having to know one tool or having to know seven different tools are two completely different games. So we strongly encourage using one process for all your data. Now we can put them in different plans, we can have different retentions, and we can treat them with different levels of priority, but we want the process itself to be very similar. It keeps the number of skill sets to a minimum. It keeps the ability to adhere to a standard much higher. So that universal view is a great place to start. So I'm so glad you brought it up. Next up, and it's often overlooked, but let's report for success. And I'm not just talking about the backups run last night. How about looking at, at audit logs How that we feed into your SecOps team? How about routinely reviewing what workloads are actually being protected? Uh, and then finally, how about ongoing security health? Does the solution you have, such as Conval, provide scorecards internally to the solution? to tell you whether you're up to date, not only in terms of our, our maintenance releases, but are you leveraging all the tools that are inherent to the software? So we've got a security dashboard that says whether or not you have multi-factor turned on, whether you have multi-persona authentication turned on for major changes like changing uh, retentions. Uh, there's actually a scorecard that scores you on whether you're leveraging all the technology you already own inside the solution and frankly, Every time you do an update to our software, that scorecard changes so that you know whether or not you're taking advantage of all those enhancements. So uh, that's another place. Commonwealth, I think, always been an industry leader in terms of very rich reporting. But here's another opportunity for us to think about what are the kinds of things that will make the whole uh, organization run smoother if we've got better reporting on it. Uh, and then two other quick points. Clean room. Uh, the more we can test, the easier we make it is. We, the easier we make it to test, the more likelihood the organization is going to succeed. If I have to stand up a physical environment every time I do some kind of testing, we're not going to test very often. It's expensive. It's hard. But if I can turn up a clean room on 20 minutes in about 20 minutes and start restoring data into it to do my testing, like with clean room on demand with Commvault, uh, that's going to make it a lot easier and a lot less intimidating to go through the process. That makes it much easier on operations teams. And then the last point I want to mention, and I've mentioned a couple times already, but it's just that important, being able to pipe uh, what Commvault detects into existing ecosystem providers like Microsoft Sentinel or Palo Alto so that SecOps doesn't have to learn a new interface. First of all, they're just going to be better at their own interface, so they're going to be able to use the interface, interface more effectively, but also it's not another tool. So it keeps skills to a minimum, keeps the result to a maximum. Such great points. Thank you so much for that. To um, finish up our call, I do just want to ask one final question to both of you. Uh, so the from today's conversation, I mean, there's so many strategies that we discussed and so many key points for our audience to take away from today. Um, what are two key points that you'd like everyone today to walk away from? And Mike, we'll go ahead and start with you. Well, I Again, I, I would just go with, uh, you know, what we've encouraged uh, and, and talked about uh, today is be just be aware things things will happen. Have that have that uh, right mindset to going into it um, uh, with knowing your current run state of things. Explore the bad, you know, explore what those bad days uh, might look like and do figure out and do some of that testing to find out where where those challenges may have. Uh, as they say, information is power, and I think that's a, a strong thing. And I, I would say, even for myself, and and listening um, to all the things that Compro provides, something that is stuck in my mind in my mind as uh, thinking about uh, being a scouter is how Cobalt literally has been a Swiss army knife for many, many years. And you think about Swiss army knife, you can have them near the small, really wide Swiss army knives because there's a lot of different tools in there. There's And I can translate that because I think of how there are so many different um, things in an environment, everything from new workloads like uh, Kubernetes uh, to you know legacy workloads like AS400 and everything in between um, that is uh, there, whether it's uh, 
uh, you know, dated Windows machines or Solaris uh, Unix or so forth. And where I've been impressed with from a uh, uh, from a, a perspective of, of working with Commvault is there's that ability to protect those and have the ability to recover. But we've heard a lot about uh, the idea of having that readiness and that goes into that mindset of how to recover and, and then providing clean rooms to know, did I recover in a good spot? That clean room you know, would make it to where, hey, this is, I'm recovering into a good known spot because a lot of times when we're trying to get the business app up and running, we may not know uh, how far a, uh, the, whether it's a virus or ransomware uh, type thing, how far that's proliferated. And so sometimes it's, how do you, uh, know the environment that you're restoring into is that is is clean and and good and so having the capability of of, of using uh, a product like what Combo does yet another tool that can be taken out is that capability to to have that so I would say you know have that preparedness you know I, I kind of live by that you know um, have that preparedness of knowing the what the before, during, and after might look like, and make that an iterative process of reviewing uh, that. And don't forget your people, because at the end of the day, we're all we're all people, and that that's where that's where we mentioned the automation helps, because you know anybody, you know whether any team, whether they have two people, whether they have ten people, eventually they have to go to sleep and go to bed at night. And so that emotional tool um, wears on people, especially over time. Uh, you get three days and five days into a recovery event. That we've we've seen it, and we've been there to help replace some of those people. So always forget that people are uh, at the core of this. And so how can we use technology to help that? Uh, to help minimize that impact. Um, and how do we do that? Is through automation, better documentation, and have pre-built scenarios that we can that we can manage. Long-winded answer, but there's there's a there's a couple things that are top of mind. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start with people. Like Mike finished, I think the first thing I'd encourage customers to do is build their cyber resilience team, and it's not just data center folks. It's not just security folks. Get people from all the different organizations that would be involved in an event. Should you should you be breached, and then come together on a regular basis take those assessments that Insight offers, bring experts to the table like Insight uh, consultants and teams to determine, or at least approach the problem with humility and say, we just don't know, how do we go about this and talk to people who do this professionally? With just that amount of knowledge, you're gonna get a better outcome. The second thing I'm gonna recommend, and we've all mentioned about a thousand times, so it's, we're gonna go a thousand and one, is test like your job, like your business depended on it. Ransomware is the number one existential threat to business right now. And if we're not testing at scale, again, at application, if not beyond level with all those interdependencies, and then taking a hard look at ourselves and how we can improve next time, that will be the thing that saves most businesses. We don't wanna figure this out for the first time during a live action. There's an old saying, I, th I think it was George Foreman who said, everybody has a strategy till they get punched in the mouth. Uh, well, let's make sure the first person who punches us in the mouth is it Mike Foreman, right? Uh, let's start with doing it at a table talk and talk about what it might actually be like before we go through the actual event. So let's let's create our team. Let's approach the problem with humility and 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 enlist experts to help us through the process and find places we can start. And then let's test that in a meaningful way so that we can at least have an idea of what that outcome might look like. But I think those two things, if they take anything away from today, will have an impact on their success in the future. Such great information from both of you. Really appreciate your time. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, and I look forward to future conversations. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks, everyone, for Thank joining. Thank you.